The Sugar Bowl kicking off between Texas and Washington. A lot of history tying these two teams together. It's, of course, where Steve Sarkeesian got his coaching start. It's also a rematch of last year's Alamo Bowl, where the Huskies got the best of the Horns 27-20. The winner of this one heads to the ship. Sugar Bowl kicks off Monday night at 845 Eastern. It is going to be a good one. We welcome you back into our studio. There's the voice you just heard. <laughs> Danny Cannell, you had of experience playing in the Sugar Bowl. You won that Sugar Bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, but this one, super interesting. A Washington team. You've got a Heisman Trophy runner up that we'll talk about in a minute. But just the matchup in here, I want to talk about Texas first. Um, a couple of things that stood out to me. Obviously, they dominated in that Big 12 championship game. Uh, they've allowed just 17.5 points per game this season and their fourth 12 win season in school history. So as they go into this game, Danny, against Washington, what has impressed you the most about this Texas team getting into the playoffs? Haley, there's accolades to go all around, right? Quinn Ewers has been spectacular when he's been healthy. The fact that they had Malik Murphy step in and the games were a little bit closer, but they were never in jeopardy of losing speaks to the surrounding talent on this roster. Probably the thing that sticks out the most to me, and we've seen Texas with prolific offenses before. But the defense, the defense is physical. And I think that's something that Washington will have to answer is the physicality of the Texas Longhorns on the defensive front seven. Can they get after Michael Penix and get him off his spot, make him throw the ball earlier than it wants to, you know, sack him, create turnovers, that type of thing? Because I do think with Texas's offense, they're going to put up some points. I think it's, you know, the Washington's defense has struggled somewhat throughout the season. Uh, I think there could be some feeling out process during the game, but this is one of the more complete rosters in the entire country. It's a reason why when there was a debate for the fourth spot, the committee didn't even look at Texas. They were in. It was Florida State versus Alabama. They had the best win of the season going to Tuscaloosa. Um, so when they're at their best, there is no doubt they can beat anybody in the country. So you mentioned the quality of depth. Jonathan Brooks was out for the end of the year, and they still were able to get those wins. And you bring up Ewers, Murphy. We saw an Archie Manning cameo in the <laughs> here. Of course. This is what Ewers was supposed to do when he arrived in Austin, right? What's at stake for him, you think, with all this prep now getting ready for a semifinal? Probably legacy. You know, when you're a Texas Longhorn quarterback, you're judged on, like Sark was saying in the little open there, we can, you know, come here to win championships. You don't go there even to win the Big 12 championship. But it's national titles, and they haven't been in this, you know, stratosphere since Vince Young was the quarterback, and they, you know, beat USC in the Rose Bowl. So that's what's at stake for him: legacy on the line for Quinn Ewers, and he's. He's uber talented, obviously, but he has been a little bit hot and cold. Uh, you know, it, it, in their only loss of the season against Oklahoma in the Red River rivalry, he started off with a couple interceptions that set them behind. Now, the same quarterback who struggled early in that game did bring him down in a position to win it late. So I think he's got to play a really clean game. He's got a ton of weapons. He can make all the throws. He's got mobility. It's just, can he pull it all together for 60 minutes on this stage? I think there's no doubt he can. It's if he does it uh, indeed. Yeah, I'm excited for this quarterback matchup in general. Of course, I mentioned it off the top, a rematch for last year. And we want to give you a look at the numbers from that 2022 Alamo Bowl. Quinn Ewers versus Michael Penix Jr. A season really for Michael Penix Jr. Maybe a little bit disappointing, Danny, that he didn't win the Heisman Trophy, but still so much uh, to be proud of in this. A 66 completion rate this year. He led the FBS in passing yards this year. Uh, just how effective has he been and what do you expect out of him in this game? He's been one of the better stories in all of college football the last two seasons, right? He started his career at Indiana with his head coach who was then the offensive coordinator. Then they part ways. You know, Penix stays at Indiana. DeBoer goes to Fresno State. Then they reunite and it's been a reunion that has been celebrated and, and rightfully so. And it's been awesome. It's been fun to watch. And Michael Penix, he was tearing up the country. I think he almost set the bar so high the first month of the season where he's averaging almost 400 yards a game that the last four games of the season, when it came back to really good numbers, they just weren't spectacular. It kind of hurt his Heisman chances. But still, he's proven he can win on the road. He can win at home. He can lead his team back from behind, which he did against Oregon the first time in the regular season. That two-throw drive that gave them the go-ahead touchdown that ended up being the winning touchdown. He can make all the throws, and he throws a beautiful uh, spiral, and he's got weapons all over the place. Three deep at the wide receiver position, three of the best wide receivers in the country, and the thing that's so dangerous is Penix can go to any one of them. He feels comfortable with all yeah. of them.
You brought up Kalen DeBoer. I don't know if he likes to use the disrespect card, Danny, but he can once again against <laughs> Oregon in the Pac-12 championship. Now in the national semifinal, his undefeated Huskies are catching four and a half here with a total of the low 60s. What's your take in terms of the spread? Tommy, I, any coach loves the disrespect card. Anything <laughs> you can do to motivate players. Like coaches' worst nightmares when everybody's telling them how good they are and how easy the game's going to be, and you're going to waltz out there, you just show up, and you're going to win. That is not the case for the Huskies, which is one of the reasons I like them catching four and a half here, Tommy, that you mentioned. They're undefeated team. They beat Oregon, who a lot of people thought was the best team in the country, twice. They're the Pac-12 champions who were the deepest, most talented conference this year, and they ran the table. I also think the games that they did endure in November, late October, November, they had a stretch of six games that were one possession games. They built some metal. Like, they've started to build uh, a toughness in finding out ways to win, winning in different ways, whether it's a low-scoring game like it was against Arizona State, a shootout like it was in the Apple Cup. Like, whatever way they found ways to win, I think there's value in that, and I think this is going to be one of those fourth-quarter games that comes down to the wire. A field goal could decide this one. So I'll take the Huskies and those points all day long, and I don't hate them to win the game outright if you want to sprinkle a little something on the money line. Okay, so you that's how you feel about the Sugar Bowl. Let's talk about the national championship, though, because we got four teams. We've talked a lot about Michigan and Alabama this week. Your outright pick to win the Natty, who is it? I'm going with Michigan. The Wolverines. I, now, I can be stubborn, Haley. Like my wife tells me that all the time. I picked them to win it all in the preseason, but I do think you have to consider what they've done this season. has been so impressive. Without Jim Harbaugh, for six games, did not phase them. They were the most dominant team from start to finish. Finish. I know there's been some criticism of their schedule with really the two biggest wins being Ohio State and Penn State, but both those games were convincing wins. They weren't really in danger of losing those, won the Big Ten championship, and I do feel like the third time is the charm for the Wolverines. They've been knocking on this door. It feels like they're about to kick it through, and for the first game in the Rose Bowl, Alabama, I don't think this is the invincible Alabama that we've seen in years past, as evidenced by losing by double digits at home, needing a fourth and 31 conversion to win the Iron Bowl. Yes, I know they beat Georgia, but I still think this team has a ways to go, and I think Michigan is going to be able to put up some points on them and slow down Jalen Milrow and company. All right, you saw FanDuel agreed with you there. Michigan, the favor to win the national championship at plus 200. Danny, stick around. We've got more bowl games that we're picking, but first, make sure you are plugged into the Cover 3 podcast, our college football podcast with all the latest headlines, news and notes you need to know. Scan that QR code on your screen, or you can listen wherever you get your podcast. Podcasts.